So who are some, some people that have uh, strongly influenced your career to date? Um, yeah, I actually feel pa- passionate about this, um, this question. I think, um, cause I've done a bit of work in this space. I think what we need, um, as practitioners is both mentors and sponsors and, and I distinguish the two quite significantly. So our mentors can be those that, you know, support our development and so on. Whereas sponsors are people who genuinely advocate for us in new roles. Mm-hmm. And I think that what we need, um, as practitioners is, is people to mentor and, and sponsor us both from a technical perspective, but also from a philosophical perspective. Um, now often our mentors and our sponsors can be the same kind of person. Um, often they're very different, but out of that, what I see, I've, I've had a number of really good influences. Dean Benson comes to mind very quickly. He's, uh, he's been very instrumental in my career. Um, certainly a lot of my network now comes from, uh, was established from, from when I was working with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's generate more opportunities down the track. But yeah, as I said, from a technical perspective and, and a sponsorship perspective as well, Dean's been great. Uh, John Pryor, uh, Franz Bosch has been has been awesome from a mentorship perspective and in terms of my development as well. Where, where do you think those conversations start with you with your team from from a staff point of view? But also, why do you think there is a bit of fear in, in change um, with yeah. you know doing lifting before running in football? Yeah, look, I've only been at Cats for a year and, and it's been a big, um, it's been a big collaborative approach between medical and fitness. So I can't really comment why that, if there's been a shift or, or so on in, in AFL. Certainly that's a different philosophy from when I was at Port Adelaide a number of years ago. I can tell you the science behind it, the purpose behind lifting in terms of a neurological and a, and a hormonal, uh, spike so mm-hmm. that we are getting boosting testosterone, which will help us to, to perform on field and, and enhance our learning experience on field. So, there is a lot to gain by lifting prior to training. Um, there is a bit of a cultural shift still required in, in AFL to allow that or facilitate that properly. But for instance, at both uh, Brumbies, at Waratahs, Wallabies, even on game day, we're having a lift prior to game because there are so many benefits behind doing that, from a, as I said, from a neurological and physiological perspective. The mental, sort of emotional mental mm. side uh, how, how would you go about developing emotional mm. mental, uh, resilience in, in AFL yeah yeah we're going back to what originally said like in terms of developing those those basic movement patterns and, and trying to keep them uh, as injury resistant as possible is pretty important um, and look don't don't get me wrong once we start implementing any change like we did with that type of work you can tend to predict where your injury threats are going to be and that's typically around your hip flexors and and calves um, so it's that and that it's about mitigating the injury risk there and so on. And yeah, again, if you can be on the field for as much as possible and, and not in the injury room, that, that helps with the resilience a lot as well. Um, but you've kind of nailed it yourself in terms of um, if we want to get build resilience, we want to, we want to build or adjust our hormonal profile in my mind. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I've done a bit of research in that space and, and build um, or, or promote testosterone production through um, priming. Pre, pre-session, pre-field. And sometimes, you know, if, if we've got a session, sometimes we actually don't want them to be completely ready. We want to build resilience by showing them that actually under stressful conditions, you can still execute what you need to execute. For footballers listening in that playing at, you know, development age or maybe a parent of a, of a 14-year-old, like how would you sort of tra- transfer that to your lower levels? Uh, is there any, you know, are there some things that definitely don't do in terms of load on the body uh, or is it, you know, or there's, yeah, what was some sort of, what's a guide yeah. to follow for a good primer with minimal equipment, yeah. I guess? You only need around about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and you just want explosive movements uh, and just low resistance. Uh, that's what I'd be looking for. The exceptions to the rule is, I definitely think that, like, for instance, in any warm up prior to, just prior to being on field, um, whether it's football, rugby, whatever, you definitely need to throw a few sprints in just to make sure everything's firing. Mm-hmm. Um, so going back to your original question, yeah, 10 to 15 minutes, explosive movements, good rest in between, light load, um, and then, yeah, as I said, four hours beforehand, but in the in the 30 minutes prior to a game, you need some high-intensity efforts, just sprint efforts. What are some uh, are your favourite ways for, for those that really struggle to wind down post-game? What are some of your favourite ways to get that, a recovery to help them be able to sleep at night and wind down from a yeah. later game. Yeah. 
Uh, look, I mean, there's another a number of um, nutritional strategies that are good. On cherry juice has been shown, so it has got like some natural melatonin, and it's been great. Um, and, uh, and other people have worked with, um, so for instance, at Brumby's, and this was driven by by David Pocock, actually. Just he made sure everyone had that headspace up and started meditating post match. Um, it kind of comes down to also what your game time is. So, for instance, if you're playing it. Two or four in the afternoon, you should be able to go to sleep pretty well by nine or ten o'clock, um, mm. and, and stay asleep. It's more if you've got that evening game and, and going to bed at, at midnight. 